As we have been in a series the last couple of weeks entitled Golden Oldies, we have been taking a fresh look at some of the Old Testament passages that that we all know. And I have some good news today uh, that this message I'm about to preach doesn't apply to any of us. How many of you like that idea? And they tell you, let me let me tell you why it doesn't apply to any of us. Is there anybody? And maybe it does. Maybe online. Is there anyone here that you have gone out in your backyard and you have built a golden calf with an altar that you worship at? Any anybody in here? Okay, good. So we can talk about other people today. And that's the beautiful thing about this passage. Now, in this passage, what we're going to see is the children of Israel have recently been brought out of slavery 400 years. They were in bondage and slavery. God showed up, used the leader Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. God brought in 10 plagues on the Egyptians. And in those 10 plagues, literally, God destroyed the political power structure of all of Egypt. He destroyed basically the gods that they served and he destroyed their economy. And in doing so, he was showing the children of Israel that the gods that the Egyptians served are dead and are nothing, but I am, in fact, alive and I'm the one true God. That was the whole point of the plagues. The children of Israel go out of the promised land singing and celebrating God's praises. They go through the Red Sea. They have a few bitter waters. And we come today to Exodus chapter 32. And we're going to see the story of the golden calf that the children of Israel made and bowed down and worshiped, saying essentially, we want to worship a God that is dead, a God that our God, the God that delivered them, delivered us, ultimately showed his superiority over. And they go back to worshiping idols that they worshiped when they were back in Egypt. Now, for you and me today, when we come to Exodus chapter 32, There are a couple of people that we all need to know about. First of all, they're the people of God. The people of God are prone to forget and prone to backslide and prone to be drawn back from the freedom they have in Christ even today or the freedom that they had in the Old Testament as the children of Israel. They are prone to go back. Everybody say, go back and enslave themselves with worship and their attitudes and their mindset and their heartbeat. Now, the good news, that's them. We would never do that, right? Remember, we're not talking about us today. We're talking about the children of Israel. The next person we want to see is a guy named Aaron. He is the priest. He is basically Moses' sidekick. He is the priest. He is the one that is to lead the children of Israel to worship. What we're going to see in this passage is Aaron, the priest, succumbs to the peer pressure of his day, the people, and he actually goes along with the children of Israel wanting to worship the gods that God defeated when they were back in Egypt. So here's what happened. There is apparently, and there are apparently priests who will be influenced by peer pressure to worship the wrong things. Now, the good news is we're talking about priests in those days, and we're certainly not talking about any preachers today, right? We're also going to meet a guy named Moses. Moses, who had led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he had an appointment with God up on the mountain. This appointment took a long time. And the children of Israel, who were at the base of the mountain, they thought, well, Moses must have died Moses comes down, catches the people after they've crafted the golden calf, after they uh, have worshipped the golden calf, and God wants to just kill them all and start over. I don't blame him for that, but we're talking about those people, not us, right? That's the good news. And Moses, this leader, intercedes on the people's behalf. And the people, some of the people repent, and God graciously steps in. Now, when we come to the Old Testament, and the New Testament. We see a lot of stories throughout the Bible. We see some stories that are, that are glad, and uh, we see some stories in the Old Testament in particular that are pretty gruesome. We see some stories that are encouraging. We see some stories that are discouraging. In every story, they also instruct us as to how we should live today. Exodus chapter 32, and the story of the golden calf is no different. That as you and I leave here today, we want to make sure that our hearts and our worship and our minds and our thoughts are not like the children of Israel. 
where having been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, you are free from bondage and sin. We don't want to turn around and put ourselves back into bondage and worshiping idols that we create for ourselves or that our current culture tells us that we need to bow down before. That's what's instructive about what we're going to see today. Now, you say, Pastor, why shouldn't we worship idols? Well, I could give you a number of reasons, but let's just go to Exodus chapter 20, and let me give you a couple, and they relate to the Ten Commandments. Now, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 32 today, but if you go to Exodus chapter 20, uh, Moses has delivered the Ten Commandments, and here's what God said to Moses, and God spoke all of these words to Moses, verse 1, Exodus chapter 20. He says, I am, God says, I am the Lord your God. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who brought you out of the land of slavery. You shall have have no other gods before me. God says, I'm first. I should always be first. And for you and me, we need to remember that, that not only was God to be first for them, he's to be first for us. Notice the next thing that he says, verse four, and you shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in heaven on earth, heaven above or earth beneath or in the waters below. And you shall not bow down to them and worship them. Why? Notice what he says, for I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of bondage and out of slavery to ultimate freedom. Now, when you and I think about an idol, it is anything that we place or culture places between us and the one true God. Now, there are times that culture and people can come in. You and I simply want to worship God, and culture can insert things and say, listen, it's okay to worship your God, but you also have to bow down to these things. Sometimes it's not culture. Sometimes it's us. That instead of us fully and faithfully worshiping the one true God, we will build our own idols that we bow down and worship. So as we journey through Exodus chapter 32, I want to encourage us with a couple of thoughts. And this will be instructive for us. And if they don't apply to you, just be sure then share them with someone you know. All right? Thought number one about our hearts and idols. We are all prone to worship and make idols, every one of us. Man, if we look, and we're going to look here in a second in Exodus chapter 32, we have to be reminded, our hearts are idol factories. Our minds are idol factories. There are things that your heart will desire that you know is against God's word, but your heart will still long for that. There are things that you and I think about that we know are contrary to God's word that you and I can't stop focusing on. Why? Because our hearts and minds are idol factories. When we come to this idea that we're all prone to make idols, it's not just the children of Israel. Man, we can look here and we can read this story and we're going to see some funny parts in this story. And there are going to be some times in this story we're going to go, really? But we also need to do the same thing in our lives. While most of us, yea, I would say all of us in the room or online, none of us has a golden calf that we walk out to in the backyard with an altar around it that we bow down and worship. However, we might be able to go in the garage and find an idol or two. How many of you understand? All the wives giving their husband an elbow right now. We might be able to walk around the house and find an idol or two, or the idol might be the house. Or it might be some other place or some other space. Your idol might be right there on your phone. How many clicks? How many likes? How many this? How many that? Does anybody care? What are the pictures that were posted? Where did they go and where can I go? Man, we are prone to make idols that can ultimately stand between us and God. It's not just the children of Israel. Now, we're going to look and say, God, it was God who brought you out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery to take you to the promised land. Go to the promised land. The children of Israel said, no, we want to build a golden calf because that's the way they worshiped back in Egypt. And you're like, weren't they on the losing team? But you and I can really be more like the children of Israel than we wish to admit because you and I have been saved by grace. We have been removed from the bondage of sin. We are free to worship God. 
in the promised land of grace and forgiveness. But how often do we go back and worship things we ought not to worship? So let's look at this idea that we're all prone to make idols. Uh, Pick it up and let's just uh, uh, begin reading in verse 1. Notice what it says. It says, when the people saw that Moses, remember Moses was the leader, Uh, He had an appointment with God. This appointment with God took a long time up on the mountain. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Now, Aaron is the priest, all right? He is the high priest. It was Aaron's job. He was kind of the pastor of the day, the preacher of the day, the high priest of the day. He was the one that led them in worship. And so they went to the right guy, And they said, Aaron, listen, we need you to help us out. Well, what did they say? Notice what they said. They said, Aaron, uh, they they said, they gathered around Aaron and said, come make for us gods that we will go, but that will go before us as this fellow Moses. We said, we really don't know what happened to him. Yes, he brought us out of Egypt, but he might be dead. Now, so here's kind of a thought. So what happened? The children of Israel decide, man, Moses might be dead for all we know. Everything we've known before now, being out in the desert, there are always idols and calves that we bow down to and worship. Therefore, we need a golden calf. So they gathered around, listen to this, they gathered around Aaron and said, listen, we need you to make something for us. This is kind of a challenge for pastors and preachers today. That we cannot be prone to succumbing to peer pressure. How many of you have noticed there's a little bit of peer pressure these days on churches to conform to culture? Anybody notice that? And sadly, far too many churches and far too many pastors are making that decision to conform to culture instead of God's commands. And I want you to know as best we can as a church, where Scripture is clear, we are going to remain clear. Because when the prophets of God and the priest of God begin, in, begin to compromise what God's word says, we are going down a slippery slope. And here you have Aaron, who was appointed by God, Moses' sidekick, who the people come to him and said, listen, we have no gods to march through the wilderness and march through the desert with. We need you to build us a God. And Aaron succumbs to peer pressure. Here's thought number two. Not only are we all prone to make idols in our life, here's thought number two. Idols will always cost you something. Every time you make an idol, it will cost you something. And let me let you in on a dirty little secret. The idols we make in our lives will cost our families the most. I'm going to say that again. The idols that we allow dads and moms to creep into our lives will cost our families the most. You say, where do you see this? Look at it in verse 2. Pick it up and let's start reading. It says this. It says, here here we are. It says, and Aaron answered them. So they've given him a little peer pressure. Aaron answered them. Said, all right, here's what we're going to do. Everybody, take off your gold earrings that your wives are wearing, your sons and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So what is he saying? All right, you want an idol? It's going to cost you something. Who did it cost most? The family, right? And so you and I need to be careful. Now, listen, I'm not saying don't have hobbies. But what I am saying, make sure that you don't compromise your worship of the one true God, your commitment to the one true God and his word alone, and ultimately depart for worshiping idols in your lives. So notice what it says. He says, listen, bring to me the gold earrings that your wives are wearing, your sons, your daughters, uh, and all that they're wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people did exactly what Aaron said. They took off all their earrings, brought them to Aaron. Notice what it did. He took them. And he made them into cast in the shape of a golden calf. Now notice what it says. He fashioned it with a tool. Now hold on to that idea. Because here in a little bit, we're going to see Aaron make an excuse. And his excuse is going to be, we don't really know how this happened. Here's the truth. You and I, if we have an idol in our life... 
We crafted it. We made it. You say, Pastor, I don't have a golden calf in my backyard. But do you have other idols in your life? You say, how would I know if I have an idol? Well, let me just give you a couple of questions to walk through. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend some of your leisure time? Do you spend too much time here and there and it comes between you and serving and worshiping the one true God? That may be an idol. What about your thoughts? What are you constantly thinking about? What are you constantly thinking about when you say, man, I I should do my devotion this morning or I should be in worship today or I should be focusing on this in my, what are you constantly thinking about? That may be an idol in your life. Here's another question. Where do you spend your money? My guess is, just like them talking about cost you something, you can follow the money trail to your idol. What do you spend too much money on? What do you spend your time on? What do you spend your thoughts on? What do you do? I mean, the reality of it is, we probably all have an idol or two. How many of you understand? And that includes me. We probably all have an idol or two that we know in our minds, we know in our hearts, if we were to just get that out of the way, I would be able to serve God in his church. I'd be able to give more to God's kingdom. I'd be able to be in worship more in person and present to sing. But I have these idols in my life. Can I remind you it costs you? And sadly, it's going to cost our families if we aren't careful. Here's kind of the third thought. Once an idol is made in your life, you will worship it. You might want to write that down. Once we make and allow an idol to be made in our life, we will bow down and worship it. If we craft an idol that we, we, want, we want a better image or it's the, self, uh, the image of self or, or it's I want to play here or I want to do this. Once we've created an idol, I will promise you we will worship it. That's exactly what happened to them. Remember, they went around Aaron and they said, hey, we think Moses must be dead because he hadn't, been, hadn't come back from the mountain in a long, long time. Make for us something, a golden calf. Oh, okay, we realize the golden calf lost the battle all the way back in Egypt. We want one. And now what we're going to see is next is once they made the idol, they didn't just say, well, just set it over there. And we'll talk about it from time to time. No, they said, we're going to worship it. And that's where you and I need to be careful in our lives. Once we build an idol, whether it's our body, ourself, a relationship, an image, music, uh, 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 some sort of house, when we build those idols and allow those idols to come in our lives, I will promise you, we will always be prone to worship the idol and not the one true God. Let's go read. Pick it up in verse, 30, uh, in verse 5. Here's what it says. It says, when Aaron saw this, he built the altar in front of the calf. So what happened? They took the gold earrings. They fashioned a calf. They said, well, a calf that nice needs an altar to worship in front of it. So it says he fashioned uh, in front of the calf an altar there. And notice what it says. He says, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Encouragement to you and me. As we sit here in this moment in this season, If the Spirit of God has convicted you or challenged you about some of the idols in your life, can I caution you about tomorrow? Can I caution you about tomorrow? You might sit here right now and say, you know what, I have to acknowledge this has become an idol in my life and it's hurting my family. Be careful because tomorrow Satan will show up in your life and say, yeah, but that was yesterday. Monday's a day to worship idols. So I want to caution you about tomorrow. If you know in your heart, if I know in my heart that there's an idol that keeps me from fully serving God, from studying God's word, from serving God and his people, and I know it today, I want you to know, regardless of what Satan tells you tomorrow, it's still an idol tomorrow. 
and it will cost our family. So notice as we go back, it says they gathered around. He built an altar and he says, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, all the people rose up. They sacrificed burnt offerings. They presented fellowship offerings. And afterwards they sat down to eat and drink. And then they got up to indulge in revelry. Now, let me just stop you right there. That word revelry, it doesn't mean they played hopscotch. That Hebrew word, said that they indulged in a sensuous lifestyle. They involved some pagan practices. Instead of being faithful to God, they allowed that to creep in to their worship and to their life. And it's a challenge for us to be careful that once we realize our heart is an idol factory, we're all prone to make, make idols. Idols will cost us and we will know they cost us. We will understand that once an idol is made, it will be worshiped. But if we aren't careful, we will do it anyway. Here's number four. If you have an idol in your life, don't ever forget that we all have excuses. We all have excuses. You say, yeah, but pastor this, or yeah, God, but you know, you know me, this is kind of my thing. We all have an excuse. Let me tell you what, when we come to Aaron, if you haven't already read ahead, his excuse is laughable. Because Moses comes down the mountain. By the way, you can read the intervening verses. verses. Moses comes, uh, begins to move down the mountain. Joshua said, hey, uh, it sounds to me like there's shouts of war. And Moses responds, whoa, whoa, whoa. As I listen to that, those aren't the shouts of victory. Those aren't the shouts of defeat. Those are the shouts of a party. He said, they're having a good time down there. Moses shows up. Can you imagine Moses? So you've been with God on the mountain. You remember, because he remembered this, that one of the things they were not supposed to do is make graven images. How many of you remember that? And Moses looks over there and sees a golden calf, sees the people bowing down at the altar, and sees the high priest Aaron over there leading in song. And Moses, notice he doesn't stop at the people. He goes straight to Aaron. Kind of a challenge to preachers today. Kind of a challenge to pastors today. That we better be careful. Because let me tell you what, at the end of the day, God's going to show up and look me into the eyes. And say, John Mark, did you faithfully preach and teach God's word regardless of how the people felt? So Moses comes down the mountain. He walks right past the people. He shows up at Aaron and said, what are you doing? And being a wonderful man of God, what does Aaron do? He lies. Go read it. He says, you're never going to guess what happened, Moses. He says, they came to me saying they wanted an idol. I said, hey, uh, why don't you take your jewelry off and throw it in the fire? Go read it. This is exactly what Aaron said. They threw it in the fire and poof, out came this golden calf. And now look at him. And he makes this, and you're kind of sitting there going, really? And Moses looks through that and says, hang on, hang on. That golden calf looks like it was fashioned with a tool. Remember, that's exactly what it says. They put it in the fire and they fashioned it with the tool. Then he says, that altar? Hmm. Moses says, you know, Aaron, that altar looks like one that we're supposed to build. And you're supposed to build as the high priest when we are going to lead our people to worship before the one true God. That looks a lot like your handiwork. And remember what Aaron said? Go read it. He goes, well, you know these people. That's always the answer, right? You know these people. They're prone to walk away. They're prone to be stiff-necked. They're prone to be stubborn. And Moses says, I get all that. But what about you? Aaron, why would you allow this to happen? See, it's one thing to sit here and think about what about Aaron? Aaron. But the bigger question for us today is, what about you? And what about me? 
What idols are in our life that keep us from serving the one true God more with our time and with our talents, with our energy, with our money, with our family? What is it? Which leads us to the last thought. And this is the one that gets us all off the hook. That if we've been caught today worshiping idols, that if we will do exactly what they did, if we will repent, God is compassionate on each and every one of us. Man, what an incredible thought. You have the children of Israel who God has just removed out of bondage in Egypt. He's leading them to a promised land. He's paved the way and they've stopped and they begin to worship idols. It had been a good opportunity for God just to say, I'm going to wipe them all out. But instead, God says, all who repent and come back to me, I will offer grace and forgiveness. See, that's a word of encouragement to you and me today. Is it regardless of what has had our heart? If we'll repent and come back to God, his grace and compassion is available. Regardless of what has had our finances, if we will repent and come back to God, he is compassionate and gracious. Whatever has distracted you and me from being in God's house with God's people, worshiping on Sunday morning, whatever has been your idol, If you simply turn in repentance, God will offer grace and forgiveness and compassion just like he did, he did in that day. So here, let me ask you a question as we close. What are your idols? What are my idols? Boy, as I think, as I look around our culture and our world, we can identify a number of idols. Sometimes we can look in churches and we can identify idols. Boy, you look in our culture, one of the biggest idols that we have is personal freedom. Listen, you do whatever you want. I'll do whatever I want. Nothing is sin. Nothing is right. Nothing is wrong. You be you. Let me tell you what. God's word says that is not the way life is to be lived. Cottonwood Creek, we can't bow down and worship at that golden calf because ultimately it's going to hurt us and it's going to hurt our kids and it's going to hurt our country. Sometimes it's not personal freedom. Sometimes it's self-image. That we, we so much care about what people think about us that we aren't willing to simply share and say the truth and sometimes it's caught up right there in our hand. It's our phone. It's, man, I don't want to say anything or, or, or that will offend anybody. I don't want to have any negative comments if I simply proclaim the truth of God's word. Why? Because I want people to like me. The truth is, when you proclaim the truth of God, not everybody's going to like you. Now, that's not permission to be a jerk, Okay. But it is permission to say, you know what, at the end of the day, I've got to be faithful to God's word. Boy, right now, you look at a golden calf in our culture, it's all the gender issues that are going on. And you better bow down. Let me tell you what, we can't do that. Because God's word says, no, nah, pretty clear. There are a lot of golden calves that our culture wants us to bow down and worship. And as the people of God, we can't do it. More importantly, let me give you a challenge in your own life. It's one thing for us to sit here and point at culture and say, I won't bow down to that golden calf if we've created them in our own lives. If they're in our own backyards, if they're in our own garages, if they're in our own houses, we can't point the finger at them until we're willing to get down and ask for God's forgiveness in our own life. Do you understand what I'm talking about? People of God, what is it that keeps us from serving more faithfully the one true God? Whatever it is, it's your golden calf. What did Moses do in the story? 
he went down and invited the people who were worshiping the golden calf to repent. You know what happened? Everybody repented. God gave them grace and forgiveness. You know what the second thing that Moses told them to do? Tear down that calf. As you leave here today in your mind, tear down the idols in your life. Make sure you put God first. There might be some conversations some dads and some moms have with each other as you journey forward. There might be some conversations that some moms and dads have with their kids. Say, this has become an idol. Boy, when it comes to the church, sometimes we create idols within a church. Sometimes it's a certain style of music that we like, and that becomes the idol. Sometimes in a church, it's other things. Certain things, I like this done, or I like it done that way. Sometimes in a church, if we aren't careful... We can build an idol out of marriage life over single life. You say, what do you say, Pastor? I'm saying there are times if we aren't careful as a church that we can look down on people who are single. And we cannot affirm them in their singleness. And we can kind of say, you know, someday they'll get married and they'll be everything God wants them to be. Can I tell you, that's a false idol. Can I give you the best example of all? How many of you think Jesus did a pretty good job at his call and ministry? Absolutely. Lived his whole life single. There's some people here right now and maybe viewing online that you're single and you're thinking, man, does God want me to get married? I don't know if he does or not. But I want to tell you whether you're single or whether you're married, God's got a plan for your life. And I don't want anybody in this room to have some idealized picture that before God uses me, I have to do this or I have to do that. I want you to know you just be who God wants you to be today. Child of God, our culture desperately needs the people of God to get our idols out of our lives, to show them what it truly means to serve and worship the one true God. See, why do we build golden calves anyway? We get impatient. We get distracted. Just like the children of Israel. So as we thought about how we would close this sermon, And as we leave here, we thought we would sing together as a congregation the truth of that old hymn, Because He Lives. And we've already talked about tomorrow. Some of you here, you know there's some idols in your life. But tomorrow, Satan will tell you it's not that big a deal. I love this song. Because He Lives, I can ultimately face tomorrow. Let's stand and let's worship together on this final song and let's sing this like the children of Israel singing to the one true God. God, thank you so much for your love for us. God, thank you so much for leaving in Scripture the truth that the people that you love so much who brought out of slavery We're still prone to worship idols instead of the one true God. But God, also thank you for showing us your compassion on them. And God, for us today, as we leave here this day, we face tomorrow not as perfect people who always worship the one true God faithfully, but people who oftentimes allow idols to show up in our lives. God, as we leave here today to head back toward the office and vacation and engage culture, God, I pray that we would tear down idols and ultimately point to the one true God who is, in fact, the God who frees from the bondage of slavery to sin, who forgives over and over again when we come back and simply confess 
who ultimately is a God we can serve because his son lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.